Hello and welcome back to AP World History Modern. Today we're going to begin day two of Unit 7.5 and resolve tensions after World War One. All right, and today we're going to be case study in the Indian National Congress and negotiated independence uh, of India from the British Empire with Mohandas Gandhi. All right, so we're looking at those continuities and changes in territorial holdings from 1900 until the present. Specifically, we're looking at anti-imperial resistance in this, with this particular example. So in the last video, we looked at uh, you know, another example of uh, anti-imperial resi uh, resistance uh, in French Indochina with Ho Chi Minh. And you were asked to uh, explain one continuity or explain one change of a nationalist leader and parties in French Indochina uh, or Vietnam between 1919 and 1975. Um, some answers that I did receive um, from students on this one. Um, so some students, you know, use the, uh, you know, continuity. Um, you know, and uh, like, for example, they, they wrote uh, answers such as um, one of the continuities of, of the nationalist leader Ho Chi Minh in his drive for, for self-determination and independence, um, or sorry, you know, was his, was his desire uh, for self-determination, right, um, you know, in making Indochina in the, you know, Independent, um, you know, and then for evidence to support that assertion of continuity, um, you know, they identified, you know, his uh, petitioning of of uh, Woodrow Wilson in 1919 at Versailles uh, in support of self determination, and then they identified the uh, the election following the you know the conclusion of peace between the you know the North Vietnamese and the French, um, you know, in the eventual election to president of Ho Chi Minh. In 1956, um, so that was one one example. Another example of continuity was, um, you know, the use of. When a, another example of the use of diplomacy, you know, is uh, sorry. Another example of a continuity uh, of the nationalist leader Ho Chi Minh in his in his drive for independence um, was the use of, um, you know, was the use of negotiation and, and alliance building. Um, you know, and that was a, you know, that's not a terrible one either to use. Um, you know, I think continuity is more difficult, right? If you're going to be using Ho Chi Minh, uh, you know, but in that one, you see, you know, so some kids even kind of played along with communism in that one. So they started their continuity by talking about 1923 and his, uh, you know, his, his attending the Comintern in Moscow, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and then talking about his his alliance building, um, you know, in the 1960s with both uh, China, you know, Mao Zedong in China, uh, you know, in, in the early 60s, Khrushchev and the Soviet Union, right? So it's a uh, so continuities. I think was a, a bit more of a challenging one, but I had a couple of good responses for that one. Uh, change was a really easy one. I think was the easy uh, easier way to go with this one. So I, I, you know, a lot of the answers. When it came to change, was you know an example of a change of the of of the uh, you know, Indo Chinese or Vietnamese nationalist leader Ho Chi Minh between 1919 and 1975, um, you know was his change in you know in tactics uh, used in order to gain independence, <clears throat> right? So um, you know, so some kind of strategic tactics or something like that. Um, and then the evidence for this is, you know, a lot of students identified his use of diplomacy initially, um, you know, citing things like, um, you know, his attending in, of, you know, of, uh, of Versailles in Paris in 1919. Um, some students even identified the OSS, you know, and, uh, you know, his attempt to work with the United States in the early 1940s, you know, in their resistance to the Japanese, um, you know, and then... You know, they, they make a note that when when independence was not recognized in uh, you know by the end of 1945, you're then going to see uh, you know a change to armed resistance against the French, 
Um, you know, and you know, you know, I even have a lot of kids even identify uh, Dian Bin Fu, right, as an example. But so there's some some ways that you can you can answer that. So we're gonna do another one of these today, um, uh, but this time about the Indian National Congress, right? So same question, but it will be Indian National Congress for our party. Um, internationalist leader specifically will be Gandhi. Okay, so because we're going to be talking about, um, or you know, because we're talking about Indochina, um, and we're talking about South Asia, technically we are talking about decolonization, and we're going to get into this in the next unit. But just so that you're familiar, we can you hear this word multiple times. Uh, decolonization is the process of any colonial rule and establishing a new government, usually by the indigenous people, uh, who are colonized, and. Right. This is largely something we talk about after World War II, and you can see just how many countries go through this process. Um, you know, in 1945, uh, when World War II ends, we have 50 countries on the planet. Uh, by the time we get to the 20th century, we're going to be over 192, or at 192, and then we've got much more than that now, right? or even more than that now. All right, so uh, let's just kind of center ourselves. What exactly are we talking about if we're talking about South Asia? Um, you know, we're talking about the British Raj, right? So in the early 1860s, um, South Asia becomes a crown colony or an official colony of the British crown, no longer under the administration of the British East India Company, right? And then our, uh, our kind of end point is, is, you know, there was definitely some, some violence in the attempts um, to get independence for South Asia, um, you know, but... By the time it becomes a crown colony, you're not going to see that, that independence. Now, um, the actual end date for this is going to be 1947, right? So 1940, or in 1947, it goes from the Raj to independent or separate states. So, <coughs> all right, so we'll, uh, but there are a couple of things to kind of look at here real quick. One is we'll see this word swaj, okay? So this is self-rule, right? Self-rule, we see it there, we see it there. Um, the Indian National Congress, all right, this is a big part of this. This is going to get formed in 1885. Um, and of course, when you're talking about the Indian National Congress, um, and when they begin to want self rule, um, you know, you're going to see them deploy a number of non violent tactics, right? Those non violent tactics include boycotts, strikes, marches, and such, all right? So, uh, Himsa, all right. And I do also kind of want to throw this out here as well because there's, I mean, there's really three names that we generally associate with South Asian independence. Um, you know, it is Gandhi, it is Muhammad Ali Jenna, uh, and it is Nehru. Right? So, you know, Gandhi and, and Jenna, I'm sorry, Gandhi and uh, Nehru, right, kind of representing the kind of Hindu population of the Indian National Congress. Um, you know, Jenna representing the you know, kind of the name that we associate with with Muslims, okay? Um, so we're going to, I just want to introduce him really quick and just kind of let you know that we're going to be talking about Jinnah, um, you know, in this, right? So he is, uh, he'll become the, he will be the leader of the Muslim League, um, you know, in the 1940s. All right, so those are kind of the end game kind of stuff, all right? All right, so before we get kind of up and running, make sure you know what the word nonviolence means, you know, make sure you know what the word civil disobedience means, Right, and, uh, and you'll see Mahatma or Mahandas, right? This is not a name, this is a, a title, okay? All right, but our story really begins, right, for today in 1885 with the creation of the Indian National Congress, and you're welcome to pause this and read through this, right? So one thing to keep in mind is this is, uh, this is a little bit more than, this is established a little bit more than 20 years after the establishment of the Raj. Uh, this is an organization which you know, initially consists of you know, upper caste, Hindus, some wealthy Muslims. Um, and relatively speaking, they are initially uh, an advisory body, uh, body for the Raj. And, you know, and uh, they're generally supportive, right, of being part of the Raj. Um, however, we do see a transformation of this around the time, around the turn of the 20th century. Right, so we see, we see a kind of a rise in nationalism, specifically Hindu nationalism, around the turn of the 20th century, as we see in this speech that was uh, given to to the Indian National Congress in 1907. Right, so this alien government, the British Raj, has ruined the country. In the beginning, all of us were taken by surprise. We were almost all uh, we were almost dazed. 
Uh, we thought that everything that the rulers did was for our good and that the English government had descended from the clouds to save us from internal and external invasions. Now we have perceived one fact that the whole of this administration was is carried on by a handful of Englishmen, uh, you know, is carried on with our assistance, right? So the Raj is ruled by a few people and it is only possible because of the support right of the indian national congress and, and people like that right we are all in in inferior service right so right an, an identification of a certain reality all right and of course with the rise of nationalism and hindu nationalism you're also going to see a splintering off of of this representation and we're going to see the creation of what becomes known as the muslim league right? what is the muslim league in 1906 and uh, so kind of similar to the, to the Indian National Congress, the Muslim League will be there to, you know, to petition and advocate uh, the British, right, uh, the British Gra uh, the British Lodge, uh, Raj, excuse me, right, so advocating for, for South Asian Muslims. All right, so World War I takes place, right, and of course World War I takes place, and, and, we, uh, and we've already kind of talked about this. You know, we've got around right, a million people mobilized and fighting in World War I. Um, you know, when, when the war is over and they start uh, cycling back home, um, we know how are they treated? They are treated uh, or they are met home with the Rollet Acts, right? So this essentially extends the repressive wartime measures. So uh, it is not uncommon in World War I that nations restricted civil liberties, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, right? right to a trial etc um you know however when the war is over to see those policies extended is was is not normal so so we see the rollet acts extended um and then very shortly after that we see uh the kind of an application of it we see a, a peaceful non-violent um you know maybe protest is not even the right word for what happened at at Amistad. um but you know it is a it is a gathering right and uh, right, and I am going to post on the the website um, this video link. It's just a, a link from a movie. Right, so so feel free to watch that, or I would highly encourage you to watch it. It's pretty short; it's six minutes, and it runs through the actual incident itself. Um, and then you see towards the end here the actual tribunal. Uh, that took place um, following the following the massacre. So I'll put this on the page with along with this video. Okay, and uh, so what we see here is, um, you know, this is uh, this is a turning point event. This is a spark event. Um, so please watch it. Okay, and uh, so in and uh, before this event, you do have a rise in nationalist you know nationalist sentiment. You do have a call for independence. But it is largely a call that's being made by, you know, by the upper class. Um, you know, the Amistad, the Amistad massacre um, will turn this call into a popular call. Um, you know, it is going to, you know, it is going to result in a wave of, you know, of, uh, of anti-colonial sentiment. Um, anti-imperialist sentiment across South Asia. Uh, very shortly after this, we're going to see Gandhi. Um, you know, rise to the to, to, to the leadership of the Indian National Congress, um, and of course, Gandhi does not come out of nowhere here. Um, you know, he is a uh, you know he is you know obviously we've kind of talked about him before as a lawyer. Um, you know, representing South Asians in South Africa. Um, you know, and uh, but he you know years before this, he will make he will return to South Asia, and uh, you know, and he will represent all kinds of. Um, you know, all kinds of different groups throughout South Asia um, in their protests against uh, British taxation and lack of representation. Um, so he's already an established figure in South Asia even before this point. Right? But once he takes this leadership position, um, you know, he, uh, you know, he uh, strongly advocates, um, you know, not just swaj or self-rule, but nonviolence or ahimsa. Right, so he's a strict Hindu, and ahimsa is a is a Hindu belief, right? In uh, in nonviolence, so you're going to see ahimsa, right, 
you know, Ahimsa as a path towards Swaj um, being advocated by, by Gandhi. And of course, one of the first things he does is um, kind of mobilizes what becomes known as the homespun movement. And, uh, and this is an acknowledgement by, by Gandhi um, and by the Indian National Congress that um, you know, the, the economic reality of South Asia had been gutted by the British. Um, you know, we see, uh, you know, the establishment of, of factories in South Asia run by British owners, uh, which means the profits are going to be going to England, um, you know, and, uh, and this had, had devastated the, the textile industry that was owned by South Asians. And uh, so the homelessman movement will be advocating not supporting uh, goods, goods made in you know, in these British-owned factories in South Asia, but instead either create your own or support local cottage industries, right? And and we'll see this movement from the early 20s right through kind of the end of Gandhi's life, right? This belief in in uh, demodernization, deindustrialization, uh, in self-sufficiency, right? And uh, and of course, uh, you know, we see this as a symbol of of South Asia even to this day on the Indian flag. Okay, all right. Uh, another example of a you know of of a himsa, right? A nonviolent form of protest, right? Is the you know, very famous salt march. Um, so they're protesting against the salt tax, and and Gandhi will in the Indian National Congress will organize a march uh, to Gan to Gan right? To the salt works there, and eventually down to the ocean, right? To the Indian Ocean. Um, Gandhi will be arrested, right? For for not paying taxes on that salt. Um, you know, and, uh, and of course this is when the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the self, self rule movement really starts to pick up support in England, right? So this movement is covered by the international press. Uh, this is when Gandhi becomes a household name outside of India. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, and once the British start to lose popular support back home, for maintaining the colony, then you're going to see kind of fruitful negotiations by the Indian National Congress. So these negotiations will result in the Government of India Act of 35, and and we're going to see uh, you know the first free elections in uh, in 1937. All right. So this does not represent independence, but it does represent a representative body, um, you know, to to voice the concerns, not just a political party. Um, I'll post this little video online as well. It's just an excerpt from, you know, about the salt march. Okay, but there's no shortage of actual photographs from the from the salt march. All right, so it's a 24 day march, 240 miles, but from here to Atlanta or so, or so. Um, you know, and uh, an important event. All right, so you do have you do have a certain reality though that happens after 1937. Um, so if you kind of go back and pause that. You know, kind of do here so you can read it if you want. Um, you know, you if you read through this, notice that the Muslims do very poorly in the 1937 election. So they make up about 30 percent of the population of South Asia. Um, you know, and there is a concern that if things continue to go the way that Gandhi or the Indian National Congress is advocating, um, and to be clear, they are advocating independence, but they're advocating an independent, secular, unified South Asia. A single state is what Gandhi was advocating. And following that 1937 election, um, the Muslim League is concerned. Right? They're concerned about democracy. They're concerned about protecting the, you know, the, uh, that 30% of the population in the democracy. So uh, in 1940, we have uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah give a very famous speech known as the Lahore Resolution. And this is when we begin to see advocation of, of a two-state solution, a Muslim state and the Hindu state. Okay? And, and this was fine and, and all. Like this was not, didn't necessarily you know, change things. But the, world war, but the war is going on. And then shortly after this, Gandhi, in the middle of World War II, is going to initiate what's known as the Quit India Movement. And the Quit India Movement is demanding immediate help, I mean, sorry, immediate independence. It is also telling South Asians to, do, uh, to not support the British uh, in World War II. So do not fight against the Japanese, do not fight against the Germans. 
Okay. And, uh, you know, and initially the Indian National Congress will go along with this. Uh, however, you are going to see a splintering happen within the Indian National Congress uh, because of this. Right. So there's going to be factions that support Gandhi because they support Ahimsa. And this is a great example of Ahimsa. Um, and there's going to be some that realize that they are, you know, they're losing influence with the British, uh, you know, by not standing with them in, you know, in the middle of this war. Um, this is definitely viewed as a time when uh, the Muslim League game gets the ear of the British, right? Because the Muslim League does not. Um, you know, kind of boycott the British during the war, you know, so, you know, it's, you know, by the time we get to the end of the Second World War, you now have Gandhi have been, has been marginalized, right, in the, in the view of the British, uh, they don't want to deal with him anymore, um, you know, and he has been marginalized within the Indian National Congress as well. Uh, we see the rise of Nehru as an alternative voice in the Indian National Congress, uh, so really, when we start talking about from the end of World War II, right, so kind of mid to late, you know, kind of you know, September, uh, by the time things wrap up in 1945, um, you know, from 1945 until August of 47 when independence happens, you know, Gandhi has a seat at the table technically, however, he is marginalized. And the two biggest names for those next kind of year and a half, two year period, uh, is going to be is going to be Nehru and Jenna. Right? Those are the two that are gonna, um, you know, who are going to be dealing with Mumbai and um, you know the British, right, the British Governor General there and representative. Okay, so you know, and uh, so when when independence finally is happen, you're going to see a partitioning into multiple states. So you'll get India, you'll get uh, West Pakistan and East Pakistan, um, which I which you know they'll. This will change its name in 1971, I think, uh, to Bangladesh, and you know, Burma eventually becomes Myanmar, All right? So, and then of course Sri Lanka, right? Historic Ceylon. All right, so you're going to see, you know, multiple states get, get created out of this, okay? And uh, right, but of course, you know, uh, you know, Gandhi will get marginalized. If you want some examples of kind of 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 how Gandhi is marginalized. Um, in the middle of the Second World War, the Bengal famine takes place. Um, you could definitely view this as an example of a British genocide. Uh, the British were exporting rice out of South Asia uh, while this was going on. All right, so I guess this would be a second famine that happens under, that we've kind of talked about um, under British colonial rule. Um, and you can see how Winston Churchill, the kind of at time prime minister, um, you know, how he viewed the famine and then, of course, how he views Gandhi. Okay, and uh, you know, and of course, Gandhi. Uh, here's another little excerpt um, about Winston Churchill right, uh, on Gandhi. Um, you know, Gandhi is, you know, Gandhi is uh, definitely not favored by by Churchill. Uh, and of course, we have this kind of a speech from from the Quit India era. Okay, and we can see, uh, you know. This is quit India is consistent with with Ahimsa, right? With those kind of fundamental beliefs of of Gandhi's. Okay, all right, uh, all right. So let's kind of wrap this up. So what are the main beliefs at the beginning of you know of uh, the nationalist movement? Um, you know, whether you're talking about you know Gandhi specifically, or you're talking about the Indian National Congress. Um, you know, what are the beliefs uh, kind of as we're you know, as we're getting near the time of independence, and what are the main beliefs after the time of independence? Okay, all right. So feel free to pause and, and read through all that. All right. And here's your SAQ for today. All right. So explain one continuity, right? One continuity, or explain one change of a nationalist leader and or party in South Asia between 1919 and 1947. Now, you know, if, if I could make any suggestions, I would say if you, want to, if you want to develop a continuity, I think Gandhi would be the easy way to go. I think if you want to develop a change, I think the Indian National Congress would be an easy way to go. Um, technically, you are welcome to use the Muslim League on this one as well. 
So, so uh, once again, we're, this is an explain SAQ, so make sure you do your assertion, right? Make your assertion or your claim. Make sure you cite specific evidence that supports the assertion. Make sure you explain that. And please email me that response. All right, that is, uh, that is all for today. All right, so I, will, I look forward to reading your response. Sabriati.